Hello, everyone, and welcome to Stories Are Structures, Video Games Are Places. Today, we want to discuss some ideas that are near and dear to my heart and a constant source of inspiration for me as a writer, as a game developer, and as an architect. But first, allow me to introduce myself and my lovely panelists. So my name is Clara Siren. I am the co-founder and creative director at Silver String Media. We make our own games. They're usually small and experimental. Uh, but just earlier today, we announced Project Pythia, the latest game that we're working on. Um, at Silver String, we also do narrative design consulting. The hat I wear the most is narrative designer. Um, I've written content or assisted in the narrative design for many indie games, including Time Spinner, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, and Celeste. Uh, I think I've always had a desire to pick apart uh, the media that we consume, critique, the stories that we tell and consider the uh, impact of those stories. Um, and while narrative video games are my trade, architecture is my discipline. Before I joined games, I studied architecture and during my architectural studies, I was always taking every opportunity I could to explore and study the architectures in video games. When I finally entered the games industry, getting on uh, close to a decade ago, uh, it was uh, with the unshakable conviction that video games and storytelling were both forms of architecture. So that's some of what I want to talk about today, but enough about me. Uh, allow me to introduce our next panelist, the fantastic George Farrell. Hello. <clears throat> yeah, I'm George Farrell, and I have been uh, working alongside Claris on Project Pythia as well. And uh, I'm excited to have all of you come to know what that is as time goes on. And outside of that, I have also been a game creator. Uh, I've released about 100 games onto the internet in the past 10 years. I've also been making and releasing art every single day, today being 600 days in a row. Um, and I am a person who really takes falling on your face and getting back up time and time again uh, to heart. And that is my approach to create creativity and um, pretty much uh, describes me in my practice in a nutshell. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Zoyander Street, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Soyanda Street. I describe myself as an artist researcher and a critic. Um, I've been working on the sort of fringes of video games for about a decade now. Um, and my work nowadays is kind of focused on doing a piece of research. Um, most of my research methods are um, about studying people and cultures and societies um, and turning that research into some form of media um, and very often that's video games. Um, I really like turning research into video games because I think of knowledge as being spatial um, and I think of uh, the truth as being very messy um, and writing forces us to make things quite tidy and linear. Um, and so finding ways to write differently and non-linearly um, I think is very important and it like gives us the possibility to uh, see the world with more nuance and complexity. And uh, um, there's just there's so many people finding ways to do that with video games now, and it's such an exciting time. Um, yeah, so my current project is uh, about, uh, it, it's based on research that I've done in the trans community in the UK, based on a fairly large number of interviews, um, and representing those interviews um, as interactive conversations with characters that are arranged um, uh, as if they're standing in a queue to use space to represent the experience of waiting. Yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. Awesome. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have the brilliant web artist and game developer, Natalie Lawhead. Hi everyone, I'm Natalie. I go by Alien Melon in my work and uh, I make experimental software and experimental games. So my latest thing is called The Electric Scene Maker. And yeah, I'm super excited to be here and also play Project Pythia when it comes out. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Okay, well, uh, I guess I just wanna start by uh, getting each of your reactions and your perspectives on the kind of two core assertions that are made uh, in the title of our panel. Stories are structures and video games are places. 
Um, does anyone want to start? I could start um, before I even I have a time to think. Um, but as I think about that, um, stories are structures and games are places. Um, it really evokes um, this understanding in me um, in regards to at least all the work that I've done is when someone is able to fully embody a place, they are able to explore, they are able to follow their impulses and also allow the world around them to uh, define what it is that is possible in the space. And stories in my mind are things that one goes through start to end and it's already a known factor what is in there before you even open the book. Um, and the experiences you have are very internal and very um, imaginative of particular inter interpretations each particular person may have within that set structure. Um, but with games, um, at least to me, it seems more like each person comes into a space where they are free to roam through taking action. And one can only take action if given the space for an action to occur. Yeah, for sure. I mean, something that we, we talk about a lot in uh, narrative design is the verb or the kind of actions that are allowed for and, and sculpting um, the, the space for a player to interact by picking, highlighting, and then really like um, pedestalizing these verbs, these actions that the player can do. And I think that that's a really cool thing. Um, Shall I call on somebody or does somebody want to go next? <laughs> uh, I will just call on uh, Zoyander then. Uh, what do you think about stories being structures and video games are places? Um, the first thing that comes to mind for me when I think about that provocation is um, the, a term that you come across when you're uh, reading about game development in Japan or talking with uh, game developers in Japan, like and people working in a lot of other disciplines. Um, Sekaikan, which um, is like the word for world and then a word that relates to like feeling and sense. Um, so it's kind of like the way a world feels. Sometimes it's translated into English as worldview, but I think that's wrong. Because I think when you talk about worldview in English, to me, that means your ideology, like the way that you choose to view the world. But Sekai Khan is what the world feels like and what the world is portrayed like and what kind of world is coming toward you. Um, so, yeah, I, I came across that word when I was doing some uh, research into Japanese game development, particularly uh, the Dreamcast um, several years ago. And it really stuck with me and I, it helped me to think about games as ways of portraying worlds. And that kind of planted this seed in me that I'm still hoping will come to fruition one day where I want to work toward making games that allow you to enter a world that represents things that actually exist out there. Um, you know, another thing about feeling a world is like, it's it's quite, it's an ethnographic approach in a way, like an ethnographer or an uh, anthropologist or a sociologist, someone who studies a society um, might use a research method that involves like being immersed in um, a context that's either unfamiliar to them or is familiar to them, but they look at it with fresh eyes and make it unfamiliar. And, when you go into that kind of research, there's a, ideally, um, and historically with colonialism, this has not always been the case, but ideally you go into that kind of situation with a lot of humility, like, I'm here because of what I don't know. I'm here because of the ways that I'm inept in this space. And by being here, I'll be changed by it, and that will teach me something. 
Um, and I think that's the strength of video games as well, that when you first start up a game, although we talk about games being about skill and mastery, you don't expect to have skill and mastery for the first like 30 hours that you play a game. Like most of our experience of playing a game is typically dominated by um, coming up against the limits of your own understanding and your own embodied knowledge um, and learning from that. And I think that a huge amount of the potential that games have for compassionate storytelling that is um, decentralized um, is in that experience of being in a place that is unfamiliar to you. Awesome, that's fantastic. That's some really inspiring stuff that I, I'm really excited to loop back to and, and discuss a little bit more. But before we go further, uh, Natalie, what do you think of stories or structures in video games or places? Yeah, I think the way uh, games encourage you to kind of just occupy a space and experience the space, it's super fascinating because I don't think you can really, there's no other, I feel like, art form where someone can give you something that came purely out of their fantasy and you really get to occupy it in your own way, move around it, like sit in certain spaces, look at certain parts, like it's just the whole concept of walking simulator, I think it's really beautiful and uh, um, inspiring. And also like, uh, I think it's really fascinating that to, to look at how two dimensional games kind of give you the same feeling too. Like it has to be a space because it, sometimes, you know, if you play a game too often, you can dream about it, you know? And that's, th these are legitimate experiences that become part of your own life story. Like when I talk about, how I play games with a friend, with friends, and we talk about it the same, like it really happened, like when we recall it. And these are genuine life experiences then that, and the way you've interacted with this type of media and moved through a space. And I feel like it's it's just such a fascinating intersection and in how you create stories in this uh, loosely defined environments and how you encourage people to experience these stories and how stories and games get structured too. Like, uh, it's a very different way of telling stories and how, how, how you design and how you encourage people to kind of come away with a takeaway of what you're trying to say. And I don't know if I'm making sense, but yeah, I like, I really liked everyone else's answers to this. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, and I think that um, something that's really interesting to me is kind of coming back to embodiment and, 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 and feeling like you are either an agent or a body in this space. Uh, a term that you used, uh, Zoyander, is embodied knowledge. And I, I, I definitely feel that a lot of times, especially in games where there is a very large skill climb that you've, you've, you've got to work towards to get to that place of mastery, like it's often kind of about closing this, 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 cybernetic or perhaps even like prosthetic loop between you and the, your character in the game and being able to move through that space. Um, and uh, all of that is of course, in conversation with the spaces that, that, you're, uh, that you're embodying, but also the sequence that you are allowed to experience the story is of course sculpted probably by a narrative designer. Uh, it, it's part of the structure of the story, but it's often, conveyed so much through the structure of the space. And in a lot of ways, it is the reason for the space to be constructed in the first place. And so I, I, I struggle, um, although I, I certainly know the difference, both uh, having studied you know, narrative design and architecture, um, I struggle to really pull them cleanly apart. And they, they, they always tend to blur together a little bit for me. Um, so something I wanna ask uh, each of y'all is what if any sort of uh, impact has these thoughts and these considerations had on your work? If no one else go wants ahead, to go Jordan, first, please. I can. Okay. Um, uh, also, you know, as everyone was giving their answers, um, something occurred to me, which was something I spent a lot of time deliberating on, um, is the ability for games to create a sixth sense in which you can sort of feel just in this weird intangible way um what is going on in the game and obviously as a developer that is created through a lot of game feel a lot of polish tends to be the feedback that allows for that sixth sense 
to um, to exist. But in that same idea, we all experience everything around us through our senses of sight, sound, so on and so forth. And by focusing on that intangible sixth sense allows for someone to feel the space that they're in in a very real way. Um, that's it's just I don't know, it's hard it's hard to describe, but I hope I'm getting my point across. Yeah, the concept of like everything in a game when you create a space, it's super intentional. So like you know, er normal spaces in real life they have a natural erosion to them, like the way a street corner maybe erodes and the cracks in the pavement and all these things, but. When you're making it in a game, you have to you intentionally have to add the stuff. So whatever you hyperfixate on is what gives this space its tone and its story. And like I feel like erosion and decay kind of imparts that impart story. So it, it's like it's really interesting that when you look at how you work that into two di two dimensional games or UI design, like every aspect of what you have on a computer is a space. Like Photoshop is a space. The UIs you're in, that's also a space. So it, it's interesting that when you try to apply a story to these uh, very non-real conceptual spaces, like, and I feel like uh, intentionally eroding it is really an amazing and interesting thing to explore. Like uh, when I was doing what for everything is going to be okay, I had some UI, UIs like, but then I worked in the little, like uh, this plugin isn't, you need a plugin to look at this, like intentionally adding this, degrading and erosion to it and I, I think that's really interesting like that that's what gives these spaces a feel is what you hyper fixate on as the designer and the artist and what you add the imperfections you add to space basically yeah that's amazing to hear like that thought that that step before playing everything is going to be okay is 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 intentional and it's this like um this, this layered journey into the space like through your own computer's interface is um that's incredible i've never heard anyone else describe that kind of process before um, i really respect that a lot uh, that's that's really remarkable um and i'm glad you were talking about interface because it's like one of the strengths of your work i think but also it's um it connects to something i was thinking about when i was sort of preparing for this panel and the one of the dangers of talking about video games as spaces is that we get so tied up in the fictional space behind the screen and we don't connect it to the material context in which we live. Um, and I think a lot of being a responsible um, designer, um, whether it's thinking about accessibility or about environmental impact um, or about labor issues is about not buying too much into the idea that everything you do is within the space of the screen. Um, everything we do is in the real world as well, and it has real world consequences. Absolutely. And like, uh, hopefully, uh, for those of you who are listening in and following along with us, um, you, you picked up that we're, we're intentionally trying to tackle these subjects in a way that maybe you haven't heard them discussed before. Like, certainly, it's easy to, to talk about um, narrative structure and kind of go at it from like a three-act structure, five-act structure, uh, Campbell's monomyth. And of course, you can also talk about, you know, video game space and architecture and how we make places in games by just focusing on the set dressing and stuff like that. But there's so much more there. There's It's so rich and so complex and so multifaceted. And I think something that just yeah like really stands out to me is what natalie was saying about how when you're creating these spaces it's really a reflection of what you fixate upon um and i think that so much of this is just entirely wrapped around sensorially like the ways in which our minds are inclined to perceive space, to read space into things where there is not. And I think this ability for our brain to perceive space and depth when there is none, to be able to understand different elements as being distinct and creating a perimeter, you know, one around the other or whatever, and to kind of understand these spatial relationships uh, is a real key, not only to how video games connect with us 
um, why they feel so good when, when we do make that connection with a game that we love, but also um, the ways in which like every single decision, no matter if it's, you know, just about what sequence, you know, scenes happen in or what the dialogue is, has some sort of spatial ramification. Um, you know, even if you're just talking about like subtitles, where the subtitles go on the screen and how that affects the overall composition of the work, it is a, a spatial consideration as much as it is any anything else. Um, I, for my own work in terms of uh, these ramifications having an impact, like although I, I love all of the int intellectual and kind of arcane aspects of video games and architecture and storytelling and how they connect to each other, for me it's the ethical implications that guide my hand the most and that definitely connects a lot to what Zoyander was saying. I, I always try to consider first and foremost the fact that the places that I make um, through and within my games will ultimately be inhabited by real people. Hopefully some of the people who are listening in right now. And y'all have full real lives and you ultimately may use that space for any number of reasons. Yes, you might be there to tell a story and yeah, I'm trying to tell you a story. Well, and I'm trying to give you a compelling, tightly designed experience, but it's also my hope and aim to create spaces and structures that can do more for the people who live there. And who spend time in that space or who choose to spend time in that space. Um, is that sparking anything for anyone or shall I move on to the next question? Um, I'll throw something in there. Um, so this, I, I'm, I really care a lot about the idea of games that are designed to passively spend time in. And I, I desperately want to have more of them. <laughs> um, so I'm working at the moment with an artist called June Hornby who made a game called Earth Tongue. Um, and I love telling people about Earth Tongue. I get so excited, um, like getting to tell somebody that I exist. Um, so Earth Tongue is like a, it's very lo-fi, pixely. It's a world sim, but it's like explicitly framed as like a terrarium. Um, so it's like a mini pretending to be a mini world um, that you get to make small interventions in, but not a whole lot. But it's very good at kind of just running in the background. It's got very peaceful music and it just scrolls and you just get to be with it for as long as you like. And it actively resists you trying to poke at it too much. Um, it's just meant to be part of where you are. Um, and I wish more designers were looking at Earth Tongue and thinking, oh gosh, like I could do something like this. Yeah. Yeah, the um, interesting thing to bring up to is Campbell's monument thing is, I feel like uh, I, I got really into the, all those theories for a while and then kind of afterwards wished I didn't because once you listen to these theories, you can't stop not seeing it. It's influenced everywhere and it kind of ruins like how you, uh, storytelling for you because you kind of it's so predictable and what I think is really interesting about storytelling in video games is that the story is so intrinsically tied to the space you create for it it's like you're basically making like a story machine the way you tell a story it, it's informed by the space that's created for it and that there's so there's it's such a unique way of storytelling or getting something across that it's like it opens up the door to so so much more unique and interesting or different or unusual ways of communicating a message. You know, like it's, I don't think I've ever played a game where the story is absolutely similar or stolen from something else, especially in the indie game space. You know, like it, it's amazing. Like it, all of them have some unique or interesting way of communicating a message. And I think that's because of how we structure spaces and how we fit uh, a story into them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like um, so much of uh, interfacing with a game, moving through a space and interfacing with a game story is a conversation. And we, we like that conversation. We like sparking that conversation uh, between the player and the game, uh, a few steps removed between the player and the dev, uh, maybe directly if it's on Twitter. Um, but also, uh, yeah, I guess, before we go any further, I want to step outside of ourselves as developers and approach this as players. I would love to hear um, each of your experiences, if you have them, where you spent a ton of time in a video game, using it more as a place to be in, exactly what Zoyander was talking about, 
more so than an ex experience to be had, like a place where you, you kind of move in, set up shop. Maybe the way you're interacting with the game isn't part of the core loop of the core a core mechanic of course it's in conversation with that still but it's uh it's a bit different um i know for myself um uh one of the games that i had that exact experience with for most of my time with it is sea of thieves which really sort of nourishes that sort of experience where you it, it is a world where anything can happen um and there is structure in it but it's so ingrained into uh the world itself you have instruments you can play at any time for no reason um you can uh there's yeah there's just an uh, extreme amount of different ways of exploring and interacting with the world and um, really just inhabiting the space out of just a desire of curiosity or wonder or just feeling a sense of peace just sailing across the sea. Um, that game is really special to me. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have much more to say about it than that, but it would be my example, at least for myself, where I have had that experience very strongly. Excellent example. Natalie, do you have an example of something like this that you've uh, experienced? Yeah, um, I really like a lot of the walking simulators on itch, like the little ones that people just kind of pull stuff and forget about. Like there's one called, I think it's called Like Camping. And it's kind of like this little dream world. And there's one space in it where it's this beautiful field of flowers but the f flowers are super huge like if you get in the field you have to look up at the flowers but from a distance it doesn't look that big so like i don't know like it's a it, it's weird but i really like getting it's like you get a craving to go back to that space so you get back into the game and you just stand there and take it in and it's just kind of i don't know it's almost like you know when you listen to music and there's this one song you can't get out of your head and you really want it back it's, it's kind of like these little games are that to me like this one moment you might have had in it and you remember it and you want to go seek it out again or there's this one that i just played recently called skate rpg i hope i'm saying that right and it's um it's like a skate a role-playing skating game where you walk around and you talk to these really interesting cute characters and it looks a bit like a glorious train wreck game you know it's, it's super indie but like it's just it's to me so special that someone took the time to create this world and these characters and this little piece of themselves and interpret it in the form of a game and put it out there and you can play it and it's kind of like it becomes part of your own experience and it's something you miss or seek out or want to go back to so yeah i'd say all of it is that for me awesome and so i mean you already had an amazing example with earth, earth tongue but if you have another one uh i'm all ears I feel like I definitely shared the example that I packaged in my head for that question. Um, I uh, I guess I could also sort of talk a little bit about um, counter playing, I guess, like deliberately choosing not to play with the game's mechanics and mm. choosing to just walk slowly through a space. Um, and it's not necessarily that there's um, a strength of the game that made it into a hangout space, uh, but it could be that you discover strengths of the game that are often ignored by doing this. Um, but also things break a little sometimes when you try to do this. So um, years and years ago, I did a um, stream of just walking slowly through LA Noir, and the I ended up hitting a seam in the world and just falling through the floor. It was the best possible ending. I'd been walking for an hour, so it was the right time to stop. Um, but yeah, it definitely felt like on the one hand, there were def parts of the game that were designed to make this feel good, like the ambient sound was perfect mm. for it. And you were getting all these snippets of dialogue and things that are going on and all these things that like game developers do to make an open world feel worldy. But then at the same time, because you're not going somewhere for a specific quest, you end up hitting an edge of the world and things get very awkward 
because spatially it's not meant to be used this way. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that's a really exciting way of exploring a game and figuring out what kind of things um, the staff at like a game studio have spent a lot of energy and effort making that would normally just be seen as set dressing and like really paying attention to what other people have um, put their own attention into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, your, your L.A. Noir Let's, uh, Let's Walk was uh, one of my first kind of experiences with like counterplay in, in that regard. And it was really eye opening for me. Um, I guess for my own example, and um, it, it was quite important uh, for my business partner that I, that I mention um, a beloved game, uh, Dark Souls. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Dark Souls and all the, the Souls Lights games, but specifically I love Fashion Souls, which for those of you who haven't played that ga uh, those games or don't know what that is, it's basically instead of going out there and facing all the horrors that await you in a game that is actively trying to resist you and kill you, like a uh, FromSoft game, Instead, you have a little fashion show and you just get up, get up on the runway next to the bonfire and you strut your stuff and you find the look that captures the moment. And I mean, to some extent, um, it is, you know, counterplay and that like I am deliberately not progressing, I'm deliberately not engaging. But it's also, as you said, uh, something that highlights a lot of the stuff that the devs actually did uh, um, put a lot of effort into. I mean, there's so many costumes in those games and the fashion is so good and the animation is so good. Uh, but it's like when the game is so punishing, it, like the bonfire is the game to some extent holding space for you to kind of stay safer around this area and kind of like a, a lobby or a waiting area uh, I love to just kind of parkour around as well while I'm uh, doing this and kind of combining like a bit of parkour and a bit of fashion. Um, and it, that that really connects to something that uh, Zoyander said earlier as well, which was kind of this embodied knowledge. So much of those games is about getting control over your avatar uh, and mastery over its movements. But more so than that, like I really think of the core gameplay as being kind of like a dance um, or some sort of other like spatial art form where you are memorizing your partner's moves. In this case, it would be an enemy or the boss or whatever. And you're knowing how they move through the space, how they take space, how their hitboxes exist in the space as well as their weapons or whatever. And you know, after a while of playing, where you can go, where it's acceptable and safe for you to go. And after a lot of practice, you have all that embodied knowledge in your mind, in your body, and in your character, and you're able to just kind of flow seamlessly and express yourself uh, through this game that's incredibly hard just to do simple things like jump or kick. Um, and that feels incredibly freeing, even if when you're not actually fighting, when you're, when, when, you, when you're not actually playing the game itself just being able to kind of get up on like the, the railing uh, that you're not supposed to, or be able to like flip off of something or make a jump that you're not supposed to, feels really satisfying. And then connecting that to getting your fashion right and your outfit right, it's something that connects to the narrative because so much of the actual narrative of those games is communicated through the flavor text of items. And so while you're picking out, you know, what weapon you want to use, what items you want to put on, you're also being in, uh, faced with like some of the most direct narration in the game as a whole. And I, I, it, it's hard to say to what extent this was an intentional um, uh, interaction that the devs allowed for versus something that the players have kind of just found, but it's definitely something that highlights a lot of work that went into creating the space and also um, shows the ways in which like you can take space as a player uh, for yourself uh, on your own terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I love that you interact with Dark Souls as such. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's so great to know that any game can be anything given the right person to look at it the right way. Um, 
you know, games can literally be anything to anyone. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And like, definitely when we're making games, we are constructing how much interaction is possible. What interactions are prioritized? What are we focusing on? What verbs are we allowing for? Um, and it's impossible to allow for any kind of interaction or to be able to make specific design moves to make these edge cases um, uh, more pleasant. But I think just being aware as a developer that this is something that people are going to want to do, that you will be surprised by people using your game in a way that isn't necessarily expected. It's something that's both really reassuring to me, but also um, a kind of a challenge to, 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 if not be able to imagine um, what exactly players will be doing in these games, to at least kind of have compassion for the fact that that will be done and to try to think about ways to um, not let my decisions carve away at that space for the player to kind of make their own gameplay, if possible. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, I actually um, just remembered um, uh, old experience um, called Burn Band. Um, I don't know if anyone's played that, but um, I mean, actually, I'm speaking about it thinking of it, it was just a special experience to me. It is essentially a walking simulator. And I guess just how all walk walking simulators um, really carve themselves out by refusing, or at least some of them refuse any particular way to experience them. And one really needs to find their own intention to which approach the experience. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know, I just love that. Mm -hmm. So as, as we get nearer to the end here, I, I would love for us to try to tie this all together. Like, clearly there are so many ways to approach this. There's so many things to think about. This is so huge and to some extent you are making decisions on what to focus on, what to, um, what to really prioritize in terms of um, interacting with the spatial and narrative aspects of a game uh, on a per project basis. But um, how would each of you go about explaining this connection, this intersection between narrative, space, experience, and play? Something that I use often is the term possibility space to kind of talk about um, the, the totality of possible ways of interfacing with the game and all the things that you can do and as a way to kind of bundle all these together in a, a nice package. But I would uh, love to hear if that's been useful a uh, way of thinking about it for y'all or if you uh, come at it from a different way. I know myself, um, possibility space is one of the best terms to use, at least for the way I approach um, allowing any narrative to unfold in a space. And as an example, um, there's this old game I made um, around the time BLM as a movement started that was really kind of encapsulation of a lot of my feelings. And it was created knowing people would generally have two main experiences and you couldn't really get a full understanding of what the game is without knowing what those two experiences are. And the idea is you have a gun and you can shoot, but nothing in the game hurts you. And most people, when they play the game, they shoot, they see the first thing, they shoot it and just habitually go through shooting, shooting, shooting. That's one experience. The other is not shooting and they've realized nothing in the game hurts them and the gun is pointless in this world that isn't out to harm them. And it's those two experiences together that like the space of possibilities that really weaves the meaning of that whole experience. Um, so yeah, I think that is the description I would use for my approach to what I do. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Natalie, do you have any thoughts to add? Yeah, uh, that was amazing, by the way. Um, I feel like 
uh, everyone when they make a game has a different mindset they approach with it like whatever is important to them like for me sometimes it's like games are just software and it's really interesting thing to have in mind because then okay how do you make software tell a story and to other people saying games are software is just the worst thing ever and it'll cause all sorts of discourse and you know so uh, in the end I feel like when you when you approach making one, the whatever is important to you is what's going to inform the space you're creating and the story you're telling, and is what will what people will come up away with too. And yeah, I, I'm trailing off, but George, your thing was really amazing. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, thanks, George. Um, I think one thing that highlights for me is the way that, especially when we talk about space and structure together. Um, like structure is often about setting norms and assumptions and what you can do when you're working with space as part of your medium of expression is challenge structural assumptions. Um, and one of the kind of joys of working with this medium, it, I think is constantly realizing that I've brought a structural assumption to something and finding opportunities to find out that like, that's unnecessary or mistaken. Um, and a big part of how I'm constantly looking at my own working practices is finding more opportunities to find out that I'm wrong or that the way that I have structured something in my own mind as well as in the game that I'm making is unnecessary. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that comes out in the way that you structure a story and the way that you structure a character arc and the way that you structure a world. Um, as well as spatial assumptions and your assumptions about how a player is going to interact with something and what they're going to um, think is possible in a space. Absolutely. Like, uh, there, there, are, there are so many different versions of the game space that we are making during development. And the first one is just the kind of idea in your head of what it's going to be like. And when, when we often think about, you know, this, this brand new project that we're working on or whatever, it's like, oh, it's going to be great because the player is going to be able to do this and they're going to do this and they're going to they're going to love this and it's going to be great and they're going to play it this way. And it, it's perfect when, when you're kind of initially encapsulating it in your mind. And it's, it's always hung on these kind of base assumptions of how people are going to approach the structure and complete the structure because the, to the totality of the architecture of the story of all of it is really a conversation, as I, as I said before, between the player and the game. And um, we have to kind of assume what that conversation is going to be before it happens. Um, but it's really cool when you're going through the different stages of development to be able to kind of work through that, uh, elevate and elaborate on your own um, assumptions as you go along. Um, now, I realize we are coming up close on uh, time, so I just want to give everybody, first of all, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I love chatting about this with you, all of you. Um, you're incredibly all so brilliant. It's it's a pleasure to be able to chat with you about this stuff. And uh, yeah, I want to give everyone an opportunity to just real quick uh, say if they have a project or something that they would like the folks who are listening at home to uh, check out. Um, for myself, I'll just say that uh, Project Pythia, which is just now live on Steam, P-Y-T-H-I-A, um, you can wishlist it. Uh, it's really cool, and it definitely connects to some extent with a lot of the things that we were talking about, but I can't tell you more yet. Soyander, uh, let's go in reverse order from when we start. Mm. Um, yeah, please check out Sys Penance. It's on uh, uh, soy.hio slash Sys Penance. It's also currently on display at the website of Site Gallery Sheffield. Um, uh, yeah, and if you are a UK trans person or originally from the UK, um, uh, then yeah, and if you are interested in contributing an interview, then uh, yeah, please get in touch. Awesome. George, do you have any uh, anything coming down the pipes besides Project Pythia? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I released uh, a puzzle game called Zob, uh, and that's on Steam, and it's uh, you know, it's on Steam. So there you go. And also, I have been working on a project that 
not ready to talk too much about yet, but I can say is the project of my dreams and I will die proudly once I am finished this project. Ooh, exciting. Natalie. Yeah, um, go check out the electric scene maker and make some scenes. <laughs> Woo, awesome. Okay, there you have it. Check out Sis Penance, Zob, and uh, Electric Zine Maker. Thank you all so much for tuning in with us.